morning. Good morning. Let us worship God. Praise the Lord, old people. For God strengthens the weak and blesses the children. God grants peace and gives abundance for all. God has created all things through the word and sustains the goodness of creation. Amen. Well, again, good morning and uh, welcome to Pastor Mark Dowdy and his wife Cheryl. Thanks for being with us. Uh, today we'll have communion. Mark will serve communion for us. A few announcements. Um, there'll be a, our annual congregational meeting on the 31st. It'll be uh, after the service. We aren't totally sure what form it'll take, but I suspect a lot like what we've been doing. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, if you can be out here, or here, out there, and in the world watching. Um, if you can be here, please be here. <clears throat> uh, session meets Monday the 11th at 6.30. Um, and uh, the Finance Committee, you know who you are. Uh, we'll get together Tuesday at 10 a.m. Uh, here socially distanced and all masked up and everything. And, and with our uh, thinking caps on, we'll try to come up with something like a financial plan for this year. It will be quite a challenge. Um, and I think that's all the announcements I have. Anybody else? I do. Correct? There's some printed copies of the Gleaner on the back table, and I apologize for the colors because my printer quit working, so they're sort of pink <laughs> instead of blue. And uh, <coughs> speaking of printed material, I checked with, I don't know if I told you this, I checked with the publishers of these days. They told me that uh, the U.S. postal system has been overwhelmed lately and that a lot of a lot of people that uh, subscribe to these days have not gotten uh, their copies, but to expect them last week. <laughs> so maybe this coming week. Um, other announcements? Okay. Let's, um, let's have a word of prayer. Almighty God, who hears our prayer, you have said that you will be present whenever two or three gather in your name. We welcome your presence and grace in our lives. We ask that you manifest your glory today and shine your light on us. Through your light, may we illuminate the lives of those around us as we feel your presence in worship today. May our knowledge of your divine mysteries continue to grow and change our lives forever. Amen. Amen. And, uh, mm -hmm. Now, Georgia Barnsdale will read from the book of Psalms. Today I'm reading the 37th Psalm, verses 1 through 11 from uh, the Good News Bible. Don't be worried on account of the wicked. Don't be jealous of those, don't be jealous of those who do wrong. They will soon disappear like grass that dries up. They will die like plants that wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Live in the land and be safe. Seek your happiness in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. Give yourself to the Lord, trust in him, and he will help you. He will make your righteousness shine like the noonday sun. Be patient and wait for the Lord to act. Don't be worried about those who, per, who prosper or those who succeed in their evil plans. Don't give in to worry or anger. 
it only leads to trouble. Those who trust in the Lord will possess the land, but the wicked will be driven. Soon the wicked will dis disappear, and you may look for them, but you will not find them. But the humble will possess the land and enjoy prosperity and peace. In this season of Christmas, we're reminded that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Yet we are fearful and anxious. We do not trust in the light of God, the word of God made flesh. Let us therefore confess our sin, trusting God's promise of light and grace. O oh God, In so many ways, God is so patient. <laughs> okay. Oh God, you create and sustain us all things by your word. Your love is manifest throughout your good creation. Indeed, your word became flesh and dwelt among us so that we might see, hear, and know you in ways never before possible. But we do not always trust in that revelation and in your sustaining power. We sometimes doubt that your abundant love and hatred in our world. Forgive our disbelief. Have mercy upon us for our failure to abide in Christ and walk in his life. Amen. Hear the good news. The word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth, and from that fullness we have all received grace upon grace. And to all who receive this good news, who believe in Jesus' name, God grants power to become children of God, power to participate in God's own life. Bear that family resemblance into the life of the world, for we are forgiven and restored to walk in the light, set on right paths of justice and peace. Carol Jones will read our scripture passages for today. Reading from the Living Bible. First we do Isaiah 60. Arise, my people. Let your light shine for all the nations to see, for the glory of the Lord is streaming from you. Darkness as black as light shall cover all the peoples of the earth, but the glory of the Lord will shine from you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see the glory of the Lord upon you. Lift up your eyes and see, for your sons and daughters are coming home to you from distant lands. Your eyes will shine with joy, your hearts will thrill, for the merchants from the world will flow to you, bringing you the wealth of many lands. Vast droves of camels will converge upon the dromedaries from Midian, Sheba, and Ephah to bring to bringing gold and incense to add to your praise of God. And then we turn to Matthew 2, 1 to 12. Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. At about that time, some astrologers from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the far off eastern lands and have come to worship him. 
King Herod was deeply disturbed by their question, and all Jerusalem was filled with rumors. He called the meeting of the Jewish religious leaders. Did the prophets tell you where the Messiah would be born, he asked? Yes, in Bethlehem, they said, for this is what the prophet of Micah wrote. O little town of Bethlehem, you are not just an unimportant Judean village, for a governor shall rise from you to rule my people, Israel. When Herod sent a private messenger to the astrologers asking them to come and see him, at this meeting he found out from them the exact time when they first saw the star. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search for the child. When you find him, come back and tell him so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the astrologers started out again and look, the star appeared to them again, standing over Bethlehem. Their joy knew no bounds. Entering the house where the baby and Mary, his mother, were, they threw themselves down before him, worship, worshiping. Then they opened their presents and gave them gold, frankincense, and mirth. But when they returned to their own land, they didn't go through Jerusalem to report to Herod, for God had warned them in a dream to go home the other way. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. for that reading sets the stage for uh, our conversation uh, this morning and uh, it's a pleasure for Cheryl and me to be here again we always look forward to it and uh, I think I, I needed to check out uh, we may come again next week I'm not sure whether it is next week we'll be here too good Lord will and the creek don't rise so uh, we hope that that's, uh, that's a good deal Oh, divine light, we confess that sometimes we look to you to be a neon sign offering easy answers to our problems in the moments when our lives are most dim. <clears throat> and we confess that sometimes we expect you to do most of the work to light our way while we sit back and watch you work. But your ever constant presence reminds us that we embody your light. So illumine our heads and hearts now as we move to hear your word through contemplation and prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's a different version of this story of three wise women instead of men who come to visit the baby Jesus. One brings a casserole, another some diapers, and some extra milk for the baby. <clears throat> and unlike the three wise men who took two years to come see Jesus, these three women came as soon as they heard of his birth. <laughs> That's a cute little story. <laughs> well, it was the time of King Herod. It wasn't a good and happy time. It was a time of oppression and suffering and injustice. The puppet King Herod of Judea at the time of the birth of Jesus was a brutal and fearful man, insecure, because he was just a pawn in the hated Roman Empire. He wasn't a real king. And can you imagine how thrilled this pretend king was on that day when a little band of wise men, magi, called the three kings from the east, showed up at, at his palace and asked for the directions to the real king of the Jews. <clears throat> These three men were astrologers, priests, scholars, seekers on a mission, and very serious about it. They had dropped everything that they were doing. They left their country and the comforts of home to set out on a long and hard journey, guided by a spectacular natural phenomena, this bright star that led them most of the way to this newborn king. 
Perhaps an ordinary star seen through extraordinary eyes, though, as one commentator says. <clears throat> In any case, they needed help to reach their final destination, so they innocently and naively turned to this lesser king, and evil wanted that for direction to the real king. These strangers are much more than part of our nativity scenes, inaccurate, of, of course, because we weren't there. Because the wise men didn't get to their destination for about two years after Jesus was born. They are also much more than three guys wanting to pay homage to this strange new king. These travelers from the east represent long-standing resistance to Western, at that time, Roman. Imperialism, says John Pilch, scripture expert at Georgetown University. <clears throat> and they've come a long way to submit to Jesus, the new king of the Judeans. In so doing, they're poking their finger in the eye of Rome and its puppets, and the vision they embody reaches far beyond Israel to embrace the entire known world of ancient times. And that's why the images of the three before us today are of, uh, if, if we had the three up here be different colors, telling us uh, what they find in Jesus is for all humanity, all humanity worldwide. It's not insignificant to us today that these Magi were very high-ranking political religious advisors to the rulers, to the rulers of empires in areas that today we know of as Iran and Iraq. And that, that's so interesting because so much angst in our land about visitors from the very places we seem to fear most in the world right now. And these strangers came from the east, the same direction from which most of Israel's conquerors approached, including Assyria and Babylon, where Jews lived in exile after the destruction of the first temple. And scholars tell us that these wise men were among the Gentiles who had been tutored by the Jews in sensing the goodness of the one true God and had been trained to raise their eyes to the horizon of God's activity in the, in the world on a daily basis. Back to Herod, though, for a moment. Herod is no dummy. He likely sensed that he was the power that was instead of the powers that be. And he reacts in fear to the news about the birth of a baby who was to bring really good news for the world. For Herod, this good news was bad news. And he turns to the religious authorities to help him figure out where to find this dangerous little baby boy. Years that Bethlehem, the home of David, the shepherd king, as the birthplace of the Messiah, would be the greatest shepherd of all. In other words, those at the center hear about what God is doing on the margins. And we know that Herod thrives on brutality and fear. So many leaders do, don't they? And now he turns to secrecy and deception, too, calling the strangers to meet behind closed doors and craftily pretending to be on the same page with them. He tells them what they need to know, and then he makes a request. 
Go and search diligently for the child, he says. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may go and pay him homage. Well, in the meantime, the wise men make their way to Bethlehem. They find the child. They are overwhelmed with joy. They offer gifts fit for a real king and they pay him homage. And then being warned in a dream, they wisely return home by a different road so Herod can't touch them. Now, we know what's coming next because I'm sure we've heard the story many times of what Herod, who represents brute power, will do with this kind of information. We've heard this story of the murder of the innocents. All the little boys in the town of Bethlehem under the age of two. The story that tells us so graphically just, just what lives in the heart of Herod. What fear and insecurity, arrogance and greed for power can do. Doing what a threatened puppet king detested in his heart, the wise men pushed on and they found Jesus. Maybe as we continue to seek Jesus and to and try to serve humanity with him, Matthew's story of the Magi backs us up with the good news of God's universal and all-encompassing grace, even pushes us to accept the objectionable of our culture. They're, they're included in the story even more and are included in the, in the circle of God's grace. Another of our insightful teachers and preachers, director of the Center of Excellence in Preaching at Calvin Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids, a guy by the name of Scott Housie says, the epiphany story, and that's what this is about, we're in the season of epiphany, it's God's revelation to us uh, of who God is and how God behaves. So it says the epiphany story is about the reach of grace. I love that, I love that phrase, the reach of, of grace. The Christ child who attracted these odd magi to his cradle will later have the same magnetic effect on Samaritan adulterers upon immoral prostitutes, greasy tax collectors on the tape, despised Roman soldiers, and ostracized lepers. <laughs> and I would add, I know Jesus has that same attraction for you and for me, calling us to share God's good news of inclusive love, forgiveness, grace with those in our families, our friends, communities, by helping out with healing and providing companionship to the lonely, words of encouragement to the depressed, speaking out against injustice in our culture and our world, feeding the hungry and bringing hope to the hopeless. I hope you know and understand that the task of this church and of any church is precisely to bring healing to people, to provide companionship to the lonely, to speak out against injustices in the culture, and to feed the hungry and bring hope to the hopeless. In thinking and praying about this story, I began to wonder how like the Magi might we be with an inkling, just an inkling, of something very important unfolding in our lives when we do meet Jesus. Something inside of us, something, a restlessness or an upsetness, a, a hunger for understanding, 
lots of us go looking and are fortunate to find this toddler born under strange circumstances to a very poor peasant couple in modest surroundings lying in a teenage mother's arms. But then things change. We find ourselves following then as Jesus grew, following a gentle shepherd who nevertheless upsets the powers that have been. We discover that a newborn baby can terrify the arrogant and bring down and bring them down in the end. We learn that God's reach of grace goes far beyond every obstacle within or without and pushes us beyond them. We learn that a great light has dawned. A light that calls all peoples, including you and me, to live our lives illuminated by its truth. And through the men from the East, we learn that Jesus is for all people. All people who would want to follow him. Finally, I would submit that the season that we are now in, the season of Epiphany, which is the season of revealing who God and Jesus is for the whole world, is an invitation for you and me to give up to Jesus all that messes us up. Our anxieties, but you're never anxious. All our depressions, but none of us are. Our insecurities, our addictions, our need for power and control, our doubts and our trying to make sense of it all. And then this new year to rest in the arms of Jesus, like the baby did so long ago as he rested in Mary's arms of love and protection and nurture. Well, I think all of this becomes even more clear as we partake now in the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper as it is called. You know the story probably very well that on this night that Jesus was betrayed, he met with his disciples in an upper room for this Passover meal. But he changed, changed the elements, changed the what was there. And because the people knew him as the bread of life, after prayer, Jesus took the bread of the Passover, remember, and changed it and said, this is now my body broken for you. And when you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember that. I've always been unsure, unclear, as to how much the disciples understood at that moment what Jesus was saying. I think they would say, well, what are you trying to tell us, Jesus? And it becomes clearer when he takes the cup of salvation, which is the representation of his blood, and his new life, and he pours it. And he said, drink, all of you, for this is my blood and my gift to you for all eternal life. So 
Be with us as we take this bread and drink this wine. May they be the gifts that you give us today to carry on as your people in this community, to bring light and hope, courage and understanding to all that the people need. So might this meal feed us to be your people and to do what you want us to do. So we set aside this common bread to a much more sacred and sacramental uh, stance, representing your body and the cup representing the gift of salvation. Thank you for this meal and bless us as we partake it, forgiving us as we go through taking your gifts this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took that cup. And you may take the cup and the bread that you have and partake, giving thanks to what God has given to you. Now we thank you, O oh God, for the gifts of this meal. The forgiveness of our sins is represented in our taking the bread and the cup. And the sustenance and the feeding of us that this meal continually gives. We thank you for that and help us to be ever grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Would you stand, please, if you're able? On this second Sunday of Christmas, we ponder the gift of light that has come into the darkness of our world, the gift of incarnation, of God becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Let us give in response to what we have been given, that we may share the light of the world with others. O oh God, receive the gifts we offer in gratitude for abundant gifts that we have received from you and now return to you to further your work in the world. Amen. Amen. And now Sandy Bakar is going to lead us in joys and concerns. And then after that, Paulie Wolf will say a prayer for us. As we bow our heads in prayer, we lift up all the prayers and praises that were spoken and unspoken today. God of incarnation, you have granted us power to become your own children, and we come before you longing to enter ever more deeply into this ministry, a mystery. By the power of your spirit at work in us, help us to abide in Jesus and to share in his life so that your love will continue to take up residence in our lives and communities. We cling to Jesus' promise as he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. Enable Christ to be shaped in our lives so that we might bear the fruit of love into the world that we might become a tributary of living water to others and a morsel of bread of life for all around us. Shape us to love as Christ loved so that we might bear witness to your light in the darkness of our world. Give us the power to live out of the new commandment that Jesus gave us to love one another. Help us to embody that love as your witness 
witnesses in a broken and distrustful world. Compel us to be your loving presence amid divisions and conflicts in our families, our workplaces, and our communities so that estrangement will not have the last word. Hear our prayers also, O oh God, for the world of nations, especially for those places where resources are in short supply. We pray especially for regions where the pandemic is overwhelming health care systems. We pray for all who are desperately ill, for doctors and nurses who tend to them, and for their families. We also pray for our own country as we transition to a new leadership and a new administration that we may navigate change peacefully. Open the hearts of civic, civic leaders in our state and in our nation that they might embrace bipartisanship efforts to address the health and economic distress in our land and help each of us to discern ways in which we can be agents of your love and peace in the communities around <coughs> us. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the love of the Lord forever. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Go from here as a witness to the light. Walk in that light as God's own children. Lift up the brokenhearted, stand with the oppressed, and let all that you do, all of it, be out of love. Amen. Amen.